did man make God? And, and we're going to discuss this. And, and with Brother Hamza, we've got a lot of different things to cover, inshallah, Brother Hamza. So first and foremost, uh, obviously, I didn't give you that introduction, Hamza, about what uh, we mean by did, uh, God make, did man make God. So um, what are your first thoughts before I begin asking you loads of questions? <laughs> First and foremost, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the opportunity to even engage in this topic with everybody here. And I thank you, Brother Jalal, Sheikh Jalal, for giving me the opportunity. I think it's very important for us to emphasize that because sometimes we think that it's the other way around, that you know, people who speak and they deliver lectures that we actually give a service. We don't. It's actually the way around where we are given the opportunity to to be able to, inshallah, by the mercy and word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to attain some of his mercy and some of his divine love as a result of doing this great work. So it is a huge honor for you to even invite me on this platform. Jazakallah, may Allah bless you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you and your family the best in this life and the best in the akhirah. I mean. I'm so, exactly. okay. it is a very interesting question. I, these type of questions, I like to call them atheist cliches because everyone has to remember that when someone asks you a question or they, they, they say something of the likes of man created God, what they're really trying to say is that we don't have any evidence, right? We don't have any evidence for our religion. And obviously, as a summary, this is fundamentally mistaken and it's fundamentally coming from a European context, because generally speaking, in the Middle Ages or the medieval period, you had the Catholic Church that was like governing Europe to, to a certain degree. And they were preventing any progressive type of thinking and they were censoring people and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, coupled with, you know, some type of intellectual persecution, religious persecution, trade rights, and so on and so forth, that facilitated what you will know as the Reformation, and you had the the, the religious wars, the eighty year wars, the ninety year the ninety year wars, the massacre on Saint Bartholomew's Day, I believe, in fifteen seventy two or something. I mean, it was Europe. It was a nightmare. So there's, there's a particular European context, and that context is religion doesn't like thinkers. Religion doesn't really like any evidence. And that's the kind of European specific history. But Islam didn't really have that kind of what you call historical baggage. So we have a different type of kind of... Yeah, I was just going to say, I was just yeah. going to say that that's because that's who they were. That's what they knew. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and just to be very nuanced and just with the Christian tradition, obviously there's a, there's a very intense and high level uh, Christian theological thinking now at different universities for sure, but we're talking about the historical experience. And that was the historical experience in Europe. So therefore, I think it's created this kind of uh, collective consciousness within people over time in the West that, you know what, religion should stay at home. Uh, religion doesn't really like progressive thinking or has or it doesn't have any evidence for itself because it's anti-science and it's anti-reason now alhamdulillah generally speaking we don't have that historical baggage right we don't have that history so that question can come from that kind of historical experience now what we also have to understand is that we have a very rich tradition like we are standing on the shoulders of giants now what do i mean by that for example, we are standing on the shoulders of Ibn Taymiyyah, the 14th century theologian that annihilated the issue of why is the evil and suffering in the world? Specifically, his student Ibn Qayyum, he wrote a book about the wisdoms of suffering and evil in the world. And they philosophically, theologically and spiritually annihilated that question. It's, not, it's a non-question, right? Uh, specifically, Ibn Taymiyyah, he spoke about the kind of divine good wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In essence, Allah has the picture. We just have a pixel. So we're standing on his shoulders. We're standing on the shoulders of Al-Ghazali, for example, the 11th century theologian. You know, he wrote many works on this issue and he had his own intellectual development. And, you know, he was, you know, attacking the philosopher of the time, the philosophers of the time. He even wrote a book 
Tahafdal philosopher, the incoherence of the philosophers. You know, he's got a really good argument for the divine singularity, meaning for the divine oneness in terms of there is only one Lord, there is only one God. We have Al Khattabi, for example, who talked about it is impossible to have an infinite regress of causes, something that we could discuss later, something that even Ibn Taymiyyah agreed on, which is, you know, you can't have a universe, for example, being created by another universe. universe and being created by another universe forever otherwise you would never have the universe in the first place so it necessitates an uncreated creator so i want everyone to understand that one of our major problems especially in the west is because we lost the link to our traditional classical scholars and because we don't have access to the arabic language and we can't access this amazing work and this is very important we don't know how to make contemporary to modernize the classical intellectual islamic tradition that of the ulama that, that basically derived from the Quran and Sunnah these, these type of intellectual and theological solutions. So I don't want you thinking this is new for us, or it's very difficult. No, not at all. You have to remember that atheists of the time in the 7th, 8th century, they were the Dahriya, right? The Dahriya, who were the Dahriya? They were like the equivalent of today's atheists. And they were dealt with, they were annihilated intellectually. They were like chewed up and spat out intellectually, right? From our intellectual tradition, from our classical ulama. You know, there's a famous debate uh, that's attributed to Abu Hanifa. You know, he annihilated the atheists of the time in just a few seconds. So I want everyone to realize that this is not new for us. I want everyone to realize that we have the answers. We're actually standing on the shoulders of giants of our ulama. So when we go to the ulama that, that looked into the Quran and the Sunnah and to the principles in the Quran and Sunnah, they understood a few things. Number one, Allah is self-evidently true, something we could unpack in a few moments. And number two, we also have arguments. For example, and the best arguments are the arguments of, of the Quran. And what's very interesting, the Quran doesn't pay much attention pay much attention to the concept of atheism itself because the whole issue is about why Allah is worthy of worship. That's like the main pillar of the Quran to announce Allah to humanity, that he is the one worthy of worship, to be loved, to be known, to be obeyed, and to, for us to single out and direct all our acts of worship to him alone. Allah focuses on shirk as well from that perspective. And atheism is actually a form of shirk. I know some people say, you know, la ilaha illallah, uh, you know, the atheists are already there because they say... To dumb it down, down. sorry, Hamza, to dumb it sorry. down. Sorry, and sure. Atheist believes. Say that again, bro. I'm saying to dumb it down, which you're basically saying an atheist is believing in something. So that's why shirk means something other than Allah, isn't it? So, the, so we, to dumb it down, you're basically saying an atheist is just another religion. Well, what I'm, in a way, yes. So what I'm saying here is... Remember about the rububiya of Allah. So Allah's divine creative power. So the oneness of Allah's lordship, the oneness of Allah's creative power. We believe he is the sole creator, sustainer, maintainer, owner of everything that exists. This is a key part of Tawheed, one of the, the categories of Tawheed, if you like. No that he's, he's, he, he, he's the unique sole creator, owner, sustainer, maintainer, fashion of everything that exists. Now, atheists, they deny that. So what? So the denial of that is a form of shirk in our tradition. But also, when you deny it, you have to attribute those descriptions to something other than Allah. So when an atheist says there is no creator, they basically have to, in some way, admit that creation created itself to a certain degree, or the universe came into existence via its own self, or via nothing, or the universe is as a result of something... Uh, material it, fundamentally it came from just some kind of material basis so they're attributing those descriptions to something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so and when you do that that is actually associating partners with Allah so from two perspectives the atheists are what you'd call mushriks people who associate partners with God what they do is they deny God altogether they deny his attributes and his, the descriptions of him being you know the creator al-khaliq him being al-khalaq, him, him being the perpetually creating. Once you deny that, in our tradition, if you deny Allah's names and attributes, that is a form of shirk. But at the same time, you have to basically attribute some of these descriptions to other than Allah, inevitably and logically. Because when you're saying there is no God, there is no creator, 
you you in your discourse and the way you try to find out solutions to life's problems and to the world around you you're going to attribute some of those descriptions to other than Allah namely the universe itself that's why you have some atheists who say the universe came from nothing and what they mean by nothing now is still something physical which is really weird and or some of them at least um so from that point of view that's it's why they would that, yeah it's something yeah. But or it's something it started what were they breaking down to a single tiny speck of atom or something and from that came everything from an explosion of that or something like that yeah so um yeah absolutely so is Allah self evidently true we could unpack that later but Allah but as I was saying the Quranic arguments are the best arguments and although Allah doesn't really talk about atheism much because it's not a default natural position of a human being okay even though Allah doesn't really mention atheism directly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through different ayat includes atheism from the via the concept of shirk but at the same time, there are at least one or two or three ayat that directly relate to atheism. One of my favorite, one of my favorite verses in the Quran is in chapter 52, verses 35 to 36. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a very eloquent way, did you come from nothing? Did you create yourself? Did you create the heavens and the earth? Indeed, you have no certainty about around three questions and a statement at the end it's so powerful that there are two functions according to the mufassari and according to those who explain the quran there are two functions of these ayats these verses function number one it's not to provide a deep philosophical argument but rather to awaken your fitrah okay to awaken your fitrah what is the fitrah the fitrah is Something that has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within you, it's your natural state. And that natural state wants to direct you towards the truth, towards the truth that Allah exists and that He's worthy of worship. I want you to imagine the fitrah like a car, like a really nice big American car. I know the chef likes American cars, I believe. Yeah. So <laughs> So a big American car. Now you could drive the car to your destination effectively if the windscreen is clean. But if it's clouded, you don't know where you're going. The fitra is very similar to the car. So you're driving a car. If it's a clean windscreen, so it's not the fitra is not clouded by sins. It's not clouded by wrong teachings and wrong environment. Then you could go to your direction of the truth. But if it's clouded, you can't. And this relates to the hadith, a prophetic, authentic tradition in Sahih Muslim of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And many of you know this hadith is that every child is born in the, on this innate nature, on this fitra. But then it's his parents that change him and make him into a Jew, a Megan or a Christian. So the ulama, the scholars discuss that there's this kind of, you know, veiling of the fitra or a clouding of the fitra. Now, every human being has been born in this state and these ayats are they function as a way of cleaning the windscreen of the fitra and that's why they have a spiritual dimension so when you give these ayats in a very powerful way to anyone they can clean the windscreen of the car that directs you towards the truth they could clean the windscreen of the fitra and i use this in qatar with the chinese atheist i use the questions that allah is talking to us it's about Allah, the verses that Allah has taught us, and Wallahi, he started as an atheist. And I, from what I remember, he, he ended up being someone who believes in a creator just by these questions. We didn't even have to have a discussion, a long discussion. It was raising this question, having a little bit of a conversation, and taking through the stages. And he said, You know, the, 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 it makes sense that there is a creator because what are these verses actually saying? They're trying to awaken something that's already known within you, which is, you know, within the fitra, some ulama say that you already know Allah exists and you already know his worthy of worship. There is another opinion concerning the fitra, which he doesn't have knowledge, but it's like a car that directs you towards the truth. And you just need to clean that car, clean the windscreen of the car. But nevertheless, the point is one of the functions of these ayats are to awaken the truth within you or to clean your fitra to direct you towards the truth. The second function is a deep theo-philosophical function, 
What does theophilosophical mean? It means using good arguments that you could that 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 that, that, that in for, for what I mean by theophilosophical is good arguments from Allah, not from our own limited minds, but the arguments Allah gives you. And if you break down these ayat, they're phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Because what is Allah saying? Allah is saying, did you come from nothing? Am khuliqu. So Allah is saying, using the word khuliqu, which means something that was created, something that came into existence. This means already you can apply this first question to anything that had a beginning. Anything. It's not just the human being. It's the car. It's Sheikh's hat. It's Sheikh's chair. It's my Bruce Lee t-shirt. Yeah. It's a grizzly anything. beard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the lahiyah, mashallah. Yeah, mashallah. So it's, it's anything that had a beginning, you could apply this question to. So when Allah says, did you come from nothing? The logic behind it is that you could apply this question to anything that had a beginning. Then Allah says, did you create yourself? Meaning, did that thing that had a beginning, did it bring itself into existence? And then Allah says, or did you create the heavens and the earth? Now, this is a little bit of a tricky one. I want to listen. Did you, the created thing, create the heavens and the earth, which is a created thing? So what is the logic behind this? And we could unpack this later, but the logic behind it is as follows. That did something that had a beginning, was that created ultimately by something else that had a beginning? If we go on forever, we know that can't be the case. And then Allah says, Indeed, you have no firm belief, implying that there is an uncreated creator. There is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-khaliq. So when you apply the logic of these four possibilities to explain anything that began to exist, you're mm -hmm. always come, going to come to the conclusion rationally that there is an uncreated creator. Remember, the logic behind these ayat is as follows. When you look at the whole universe, and we know the universe had a beginning now, this is based on science, although we know science changes, but we're just referring to it from a just kind of supportive point of view. But there are so many more other reasons why the universe began. Here's, philosophical, here's for us, okay? mathematical, etc. Yeah, go for it. I know you kind of touched on this. We're going to do a lot of questions, a lot of different verses. Yeah, well, a lot of it actually we need to empathize with and make them understand, you know what? There are thousands of names of God all the way back to like 6,000 BC Sumeria. So people have been trying to find out who God is or they've been distorting revelation of God for millennia, for thousands of years. So yes, there are many conceptions of God, many ideas of God that have been man-made, absolutely. It, they've just made it up or they've distorted the original truth. Whatever the case may be, we need to first start, I think when it comes to conversations, to say to them, you know what, I, let me empathize with you here. I actually agree. There are many versions of God that have been man-made. That's the whole point of Islam. That's the whole point of the Quran, the final revelation. That is the whole point of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the final prophet to teach people what is the true understanding of God, the understanding of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So in some way, Sheikh, they have a point. In some way, they're agreeing with the Islamic narrative, which is, yes, there have been people have been revealed re uh, revelation for millennia. There have been thousands of prophets, but people over time have started to make up things about God that God hasn't revealed to them. They start to do one of the greatest injustices, which is to say things about God that God hasn't said about himself. So yes, you're right to a degree that, that man created God from the point of view that he created the false understanding of God, the false names of God, the false ideas about God. But that's the whole point of Islam. It came here to clarify to awaken the fitra, to demystify the windscreen, and so on and so forth, to make us realize that this is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And there are many ways, by the way, to awaken the fitra, Sheikh, or to clean the windscreen, to let's, uncloud let's the windscreen. Yeah. And let's, let's wait. And Brother Hamza, on WhatsApp, I've got the following. How would we argue the following? The better we understand human psychology and neurology, the more we will uncover and un uh, uncover the underpinnings of religion. 
Some of them, like the attachment, uh, uh, the attachment system, push us towards a belief in gods and make departing from it extraordinarily difficult. Ultimate, we create the idea of God from the concept of attachment, needs, adaptive strategies. How can we convince people this is indeed the concept of the fitra, not due to natural adaptive strategies? Yes, it's a very good question. Well, the issue with neuroscience and neurology and neurobiology is that there is an assumption in that question. And the assumption in that question is that if you can find the neurobiological happenings or the neurobiological firings in the brain and the pathways for what you call, you know, attachment or whatever the case may be, then therefore you've explained that we've made up the idea of God. That's actually a false understanding of the question because all you are doing is you are unraveling the physical stuff okay you're assuming that the physical stuff means something it means that you know this explains why we need god and therefore god doesn't exist now that is not a neuroscientific conclusion that is your own or our own conclusion because we've got our own atheistic naturalistic baggage what we but what we can say, we could say the opposite. The door swings both ways. If you were to find neurobiological pathways and the physical stuff in the brain that correlates to attachment and therefore it explains, you know, our need for God, one would argue, well, maybe that was, that was the physical cause that Allah created within us in order for us to find him, right? So you need to understand the door swings both ways because remember behind every question sometimes is an assumption. And when it comes to neuroscience, even when you, because I actually did this for my master's, I did, um, I, I, I talked about the hard problem of consciousness, which relates to some of the stuff that you're talking about, but specifically it was about neurobiology and the physicalist, the physical understanding of consciousness. And when they say, for example, you know, once we map out all the neurochemical firings in the brain, we're going to find out what consciousness is about. That has an assumption. What is the assumption? It's not a science, it's a scientific assumption, but it's not scientific. It's a philosophical assumption, which is that they assume that the physical stuff in the brain is equal to or identical to consciousness, or can or, or consciousness can be reduced to the physical stuff in the brain. That is an assumption that cannot be proven scientifically because you need the assumption before you do the neuroscience. So you need to get into the philosophy. And when you get into the philosophy, the philosophy of the mind, and you study physicalism, the different forms of physicalism, like functionalism and reductive materialism, and all of that stuff, you realize that they don't have an answer for feelings. They don't have an answer for why we have inner subjective conscious states. Now, I don't want to, it's a huge topic I don't want to talk about now, but yeah. I just want to bring it into light for you to understand that such questions have assumptions so the, the final part of the question is how do you know your concept of god is true well when we continue today's tonight's uh, live session when we talk about chapter 55 verse, verses uh, chapter 52 verses 35 to 36 and we talk about surah ikhlas which is the basic concept of god in the islamic tradition you would see that it's rational it makes sense it's intuitive and it's natural and all of those things is going to compel you to say this is the only rational concept of God. Nothing else comes close to it. And we're using our rational faculties. And there's nothing wrong with using your rational faculties in the Islamic tradition. For example, Ibn Taymiyyah, the famous scholar, he said there is no true contradiction between the aql and the naql, the, the, the intellect and the text itself, revelation. But you have to have a sound aql. You have to have sound reasoning. And the Quran, the way it questions you, allows you to facilitate that sound reason. So if you're a person with sound reasoning and you have a sincere heart, because the aql in the Islamic tradition, the intellect is a function of the heart. So if you have a sound heart, sincere, you don't have any presuppositions, assumptions, emotional baggage, you haven't already made your mind up, you don't have ego or past experiences or trauma, they just want to prove religion wrong just because you had a bad time, all of that stuff. If you come to Islam sincerely and you see the concept of God and the very basic but profound arguments, you know that they're rational, intuitive, and natural. So that's how I would answer that question. 
they also said fitra it's an abs abstract concept that requires belief whereas natural adaptive strategies are studies conducted and proven within the psychology of peoples and animals fair you want to yeah. say anything else on that yeah just that was, that was beautifully put just to add to that as well you remember not everything requires evidence now that is a rational thing to say it's irrational to say everything requires evidence let me explain this further so you refer to neurobiology and science. Now, I studied, I specialized in the philosophy of science. The, now, when you look into the philosophy of science, there are so many assumptions you can't prove, but you need in order for you to do science. Let me repeat that. There are so many assumptions in the scientific method or in science itself that you require before you do science. Science can't prove them, but it needs them. For example, causality, causes and effects. Effects have causes. Now you may say, Hamza, but I can see causes and effects. Yes, but can you see the nature of the causal link? No, this is what you call metaphysics. In Western philosophy, it's in the domain of knowledge of metaphysics and they haven't solved the problem today. There are so many differences of opinion on what is the nature of the causal link. But science has to adopt a certain position that there are causes and effects and it has to adopt a physicalist understanding of causes and effects from that point of view. Science can't prove that per se because it's based on first principles, based on what I just said, metaphysics. Another assumption of science is that nature is uniform. They have to start with this premise, this assumption that nature is uniform. And you can't say, well, I know nature is uniform because I can observe it. No, you can't because you haven't observed all of nature we always have limited observations so the reason they need to say nature is uniform is because when they have scientific theories and they believe that that scientific theory is true they have limited data take evolution for example and we may speak about this later evolution for example is, is uh, darwinian evolution explains what you call biological change that biology changes species change living things change over time and the Darwinian mechanism explains that. Now, they all believe Darwinism to be true. However, have they observed all of biological change ever possible on this planet? No, we haven't even explored like 95% of the ocean. So you can never say, I, 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 we know we've got all the data. We just don't. But the reason they can apply the Darwinian mechanism and say this explains all of biological change is because of the assumption in the philosophy of science, which is nature is uniform. Because once you have a theory that's well confirmed with some data and it has predictive success, it can make predictions and it succeeds in those predictions, then they say you could apply this to all of the phenomena that we're trying to deal with, even though you haven't observed all of the phenomena. That's because of the assumption that nature is uniform. And if you never had that assumption, you would never be able to take a theory and apply it to things that you've never observed before. I know that's a bit complex, but what I'm trying to say here is there are assumptions in science that you can't even prove, but science needs them in order for science to grow. Now, the, the reason I said this is because the whole concept of the fitra doesn't necessarily need empirical proof of evidence like you're mentioning. All it needs, because it's a metaphysical idea, it explains the physical, right? Now you can't say the physical explains the physical itself. No, because you need something else to explain the physical. And what we're saying is the concept of the fitra is like a lens that you put on your eyes in order to make sense of reality. Does the fitra make sense of right and wrong? Does the fitra make sense of our yearning to worship something? Because all human beings worship something even if you don't believe in God, because you're always going to love something the most, you're always going to want to know something the most, you're always going to obey something the most, and you're always going to direct acts of worship like gratitude towards something the most. Our default position is to worship, as Martin Ling said, man cannot not worship. We're always in a state of worship because there's always something that we're loving, knowing, and obeying, and 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 being grateful to the most, yeah? So the point here is, it makes sense of that need to worship, right? It makes sense of all the things that Sheikh was just talking about. That is adequate in order for you to say, this is a good lens to understand reality. And that's why it's very important, not for you to think that everything requires empirical evidence, because you will not have much proof for many things that we believe to be true. 
like uh, where is the empirical evidence that time is real that the past actually was the present because it could you can postulate you can say that actually the universe was just created five minutes ago with all of our memories right you can say that there's nothing incoherent about that notion that the Not universe that was i remember when i was a kid i did think that <laughs> yeah well there you go so the point is uh, but we believe in these notions of time because it makes sense of our memories. It makes sense of the psychological understanding of the, the linear nature of time. It makes sense of our aging and all of that stuff. But it could be that the universe was created five minutes ago with all of our memories, right? But the point I'm trying to say here is, you know, be very careful when you think everything requires some kind of empirical evidence because that is a false notion as well. Uh, and in actual fact, a lot of our evidence that we believe to be true is things that we believe to be true is not always based on empirical data. It's based on what you call testimony, which in epistemology, which is the study of knowledge and the sources of knowledge, that you rely on the say-so of others. I remember when I had a debate with Professor Lawrence Krauss, and I wanted to expose this assumption he had that uh, all truths come from empirical data kind of thing. And he was like, yes, I'm a scientist. And I said, yeah, but there are other sources of knowledge. And he said, like, what? And I said, like, testimony the safe of others yeah. and he almost sniggered at me and then i said to him do you believe in evolution he was like yes i do the science and then i said have you done all the experiments yourself no he had to rely on the say so of someone else's experiment so even in science you have to rely on the say so of others because you don't have the time in your lifetime to do all the experiments yourself so the testimony testimonial transmission is very important even for science which is not an empirical thing Anyway, the point here is, is just to unpack some the assumption type of, behind type of that position as well. It's a type Sorry, of a, it's a type of a taklid, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's absolutely. A type of a taklid. You know what? You in the end, you're gonna learn from someone, right? You have to absolutely, absolutely. Uh, part of the institute that I belong to, we do this uh, development and empowering of Muslims to be able to articulate these issues. And I was doing a private session. It's a 10 week course for United Muslims of Australia. And I, and I spoke about this and it was quite emotional. Okay, so there's a few things that we have to really, really focus on this year. The first thing is we need to inculcate in our children from the very beginning, why? If you know your why, they will find out the how and they will find out everything else. So why are you here? Why do you exist? Why is Allah worthy of worship? All of these things are answered rationally and spiritually in the Quran and the Sunnah. But many of the parents, they don't teach the why in any profound, deep way through conversation, through loving dialogue at home. Rather, they're taught the how, the do's and the don'ts. Don't get me wrong, do's and don'ts are very important. But if you neglect focusing on the why, why is Allah worthy of worship? Let me ask parents in the audience the following question and think about it. Have you ever taught your children why Allah is worthy of salah? Why is Allah worthy of worship? The, whole, the Quran always talks about this, but have we ever inculcated in our hearts in our, and in our minds at home the fact that Allah is worthy of worship? The fact that he's worthy of our love? to be known, to be obeyed, for us to be humble before him and for us to direct all acts of worship to him alone. The internal acts of worship of the heart, like love and gratitude and tawakkul and reliance and the external acts of worship, like giving sadaqah and zakah and our salah and prayers. Have we explained to our children why Allah is worthy of worship? We've explained to them how to worship, but have we really explain to them why Allah is worthy of worship. Why is all praise and gratitude, why does that belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone? These are very important things that we have to address immediately in our homes because it is the fundamental essence and basis of our, of our religion, number one. Number two, we have to understand social psychology, meaning we have to understand that Every human being has a need to belong and they have a need to feel certain. In social psychology, this is called informational normative influence and social normative influence. What does this mean? Well, take, for example, informational social influence. Informational social influence is that I want to have certainty. Now, if you don't get that certainty from your subgroup, from the Muslim community, if you go to an imam and you ask him a question, he chucks you out of the masjid, 
or he doesn't have empathy, he doesn't know how to address you, and your parents ignore you because they're so busy making money for the second house that they don't really need, then where are they going to go? They're going to go to the dominant group, which is the kind of secular, non-religious group in the areas that we live in the West. So it's very important to understand that all human beings want to feel certain, informational social influence. We want to feel certain. If we don't get that certainty from our subgroup, meaning the Muslim community, the imams and the leaders, they're going to go to the dominant group just to find some certainty. And because they're more dominant, they more have more people, then they're going to connect with them and they're going to adopt their ideas just to feel some such sort of certainty. The second form of influence is normative social influence, which basically is our need for, to be for belonging. If we don't make our children feel belonging in the masajid, they, they don't feel belonging in the Muslim community because the Muslim community always likes to backbite and slander and say, you're a deviant, you do this. If we don't have this compassionate, open door policy in our Muslim community, then our youth who look a bit different who maybe want to wear more stylish clothes or they have a bit of a weird way of doing things that's not maybe in line with a social conservative outlook. Yeah? If we push them away and we don't make them belong to the, to the Muslim subgroup, they're going to go to the dominant group, the irreligious group, the secular group, especially those living in the West, in order to feel a sense of belonging. And when they belong to those people, they would adopt their ideas. So it's very important to ensure I don't think that people understand. give them that that growth absolutely so people need to feel certain they need to belong this is well known in social psychology if they don't find that certainty in our, in the subgroup the muslim community they don't find the belonging in the muslim community they're going to go elsewhere this is a fact so report yourself the other thing is how did we morally prioritize islam at home now you may have to you have to understand something we may look like practicing Muslims, ethical Muslims. You know, you have the garb, the beard, you pray five times a day. But what were your moral priorities at home? If your moral priorities at home were like too many expectations for our children. For example, we said to our children, you have to be the best student. You have to go to the best university. You have to find the most beautiful wife. You have to get the biggest house and the biggest car. All of these things. If these were very, there were huge pressures for the child growing up. And they didn't have a huge pressure of worshipping Allah, fulfilling their purpose in life, then that sometimes basically gives them the wrong sense of their moral compass is, is not working properly. And then they eventually, when they get older, they make the wrong decisions. Because there's no point thinking just because you pray five times a day and you look the part that actually you are the part. That's not the case. That's not the case at all. Because in your moral decision making, when your children were growing up, dunya, uh, attachment to the emptiness of the kind of the, the glitter of the world and the materialism was actually a priority for you. You cared about what people thought. You cared about, you know, how much money they're going to make. You cared about if they're the smartest person in the class. We gave them all of these expectations, but we never gave them the, the, the one expectation of just be a good person, just be a good Muslim. And I'm a strong believer. It, we should encourage, you know, educational growth and financial growth for sure. But it has to come from the point of view that they are, they are, they are sorted or they are focusing primarily on the main purpose of their existence, which is to worship Allah. And if they have that in place and everything grows. But in, sometimes in our even Muslim conservative social circles, parents, you know, they, they may get the children to pray and to worship God. But everything else is of a priority from a real point of view, you know, chasing the world, getting the money, this, that and the other. And that's why people leave. And that's why people leave and they, they have doubts and so on and so forth. And the final thing is create a culture at home of questioning, of answering questions and not judging them. And if you don't know, say you don't know, just seek a specialist because you have to know the nature of these type of questions. They can turn into shubuhat. Shubuhat in Arabic is the plural for shubha. A shubha is a destructive doubt and it attaches onto the heart and it wants to suck away your faith and your certainty. Now, a shubha has no intellectual basis, but it, it resembles the truth by its falsehood. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's why it's a shubha. Shubha tushbihu, to, to resemble something. That's what tushbihu means, to resemble something that it's not. And 
if you don't if you're not careful with these questions and you don't address them in a spiritual sincere and empathic way they can really latch onto the heart like a parasite and suck away the faith of our children and that's what's important that when they have these type of questions to empower them to give them effective strategies on how to deal with these type of questions one way of dealing with these effective strategies is strengthening the spiritual heart do they make dua do they supplicate to allah are they close to allah do they do the dhikr uh, do they do the remembrance of god do they pray these are very the connection of allah is very important another strategy is allow them to seek specialists there are specialists in our ummah in our community that can answer these questions another effective strategy is to actually study ilm, to study Islamic knowledge. When was the last time we were at home and we studied a book of creed or we, or we just did tadabbur, pondering over the Qur'an? And pondering over the Qur'an is a life-changing experience. Allah says, do they not ponder over the Qur'an or are there locks on their hearts? Now, if you mirror the meaning, this could mean the more you ponder over the Qur'an, the more you, your heart becomes unlocked to receive the guidance and mercy of Allah. So there are effective strategies on how to deal with these shubuhat these destructive doubts before they become destructive doubts. But you need to create a culture at home. Like for example, uh, my son, he was seven at the time and he asked me a question about, I think it was to do something to do about God. And I didn't answer the question first. I said, that's a really good question. And you know, I, then I asked him, you know, if you were to answer that question to yourself, if you had to try and answer yourself, say you were someone else and you were answering yourself, what would you say? So that put him in a position of power. It put him in a position of, okay, now I need to help myself. And he actually had the answer already. I'm a strong believer that I always say to them, generally, I say to them, that you already have the answers. You just need to find it. And when you put them in a position of power within a safe environment to look at themselves and answer their own questions and after guide them through that process, it's very, very effective. But you need that culture at home. So there's a lot we need to do. And there is some academic studies, I believe, that people actually tend to be atheists because they see the religious parents being hypocrites. So when the religious parents say, don't backbite, but they always backbite, then they're going to say, well, this is not for me. And what you need to show is humility as parents sometimes and say, you know what? This is what Allah says. This is what the person said. I'm not perfect. I'm going to mess up. And once they see that humility in you and they know that, your mistakes is not because of hypocrisy, but because of just weakness and all human beings are weak, then they'll understand that everyone's on a journey. But if you come across as extremely what you call um, authoritarian in your parenting, then that's a bit of a problem because you'll come across as a hypocrite because they'll see, they'll, you, they'll hear you say one thing, but you do something else. Oh, don't get, don't get involved in dodgy financial transactions. It's haram. And then they end up doing dodgy financial transactions. Don't backbite, but they see backbiting. Don't be greedy, but they see greed. Don't uh, fall in love with the dunya, with the ephemeral nature of the world, but they fall in love with the ephemeral nature of the world. Studies, a study has shown, I think it's one study at least, that if they're going to grow up like that, then if they're going to see their parents as hypocrites, they're going to be like, my salama, this is not for me. So that's a part of a traumatic experience that we need to deal with. On to the next question here. Many young Muslims go to university and get, conf oh, sorry, that's the one I read. Muslims claim that a proof uh, a Muslim's claim that a proof the Quran was from Allah is that it contains scientifically accurate information about embryology before man even discovered it for himself. However, all the information in the Quran regarding embryology is copied from three sources. A, a Greek doctor named Galen, okay, a Jewish doctor named Samuel, uh, Ye Yehudi, and the, with the Greek father of medicine, hypocrites who lived 400 bc something like that i think hypocrites hypocrites <laughs> sorry can brother hamza shed some light Bismillah, hamza. oh my god this is a long topic now look the first thing we need to realize is the question again always question your question the question has an assumption you're assuming that similarity means copying that's not true there's no necessary logical link between something being similar and the fact that therefore it copied from that thing it's similar to. That's a logical fallacy. It's fallacious. It's an error in someone's reasoning. Just because there is a similarity, it doesn't imply plagiarism or copying. That's the first point. The second point is, let me give you the general thesis, then we go more specific to your question. The general thesis is this. Who cares if science somehow contradicts the Quran? Just, let's just be very honest. Like, 
when you study the philosophy of science, you realize it makes no difference. Who cares? How, what's the big deal? Because, there's, because, because of the nature of science, there's going to be a period of time where some scientist or some science is going to contradict itself. Can I just say, I, I don't mean to be funny or semantical, but just, it's not science. It's someone who is studying who claimed. Yeah, well, <laughs> Cause, cause science, I like that. Science, science is not a source. Science just means a study of. And the only time you get that kind of comment, especially atheists, they say it all the time. It gets under my skin. It's such an ignorant thing they say. Because science is not a source. It means you're studying. So when they quote science, they should quote the person. And if they don't know, then that means they themselves don't know what they're talking about. That's an interesting point. It's the study of something by someone. Correct. Now, so now, now said this so, about so, Islam that contradicts Islam. So yes. what someone said, like like uh, something uh, Dawkins said or or you know anything in Darwinism that would contradict the Quran, fine. You could say that. And now Hamza it's open game to stay he'll just slaughter the concept and so, that's yeah so yeah so the concept is is is, is simple in, in its essence because when we see what science is it's a method of study and it bases in it base it bases its conclusion on limited data it's never going to have all of the data or an infinite number of observations of a particular phenomenon just like what we mentioned about darwinian the darwinian mechanism earlier we said that we haven't even observed all of biological change. We haven't even observed all of the species in, in, the, in, in the known world. We haven't observed around, what, 95% of the ocean. So we can't say we've got all the data. We don't. You could say you have adequate data and you've got a theory that makes predictions, for sure. But you can't say you have all the data. So what does this mean? And I, I want you to really understand this concept. It's very important in the philosophy of science. You can always have another observation in the future that contradicts your current conclusions. I repeat, you can always have another observation in the future that contradicts current conclusions. Even Richard Dawkins himself, he's so evangelical about Darwinism. This is his own words, and I'm paraphrasing. It's in his book, A Devil's Chaplain. Check it out. He says that we may have data in the future that would make us change evolution or reject it altogether. Think about what he's saying here. Every sincere scientist know that it's a study of what we observe. And as the atheist philosopher, Elliot yeah, study Sobers, of, exactly, study yeah. of. And it might be wrong. It's a person that said something. I hate it that people say science as if it's a book or a source. It's not, it doesn't exist. Yeah, science, for sure. when you, it's a person like, Although, yeah, although they would, they would, yeah, they, they, would, they may argue that there is sometimes a consensus in science, but even saying that, then it becomes a rule. Then you can say a scientific law. Fair enough. So, okay, interesting point. So, what I would say here is know this concept that there can always be another observation that contradicts previous conclusions, even with something as established as Darwinism. Even Richard Dawkins says this. So, what have we learned here? We've learned that science is dynamic. It doesn't lead to certainty in terms of absolute truths. And that's the beauty of science because it's about progressive knowledge. The more data we get, the more different understanding and connections we can make, we'll get closer to the truth from that point of view. But you can't say it's absolute 100%. Knowing this concept alone is going to save your iman, your faith. Because when something comes along today and says, here's a scientific conclusion, and then there's no way of reconciling it with revelation. You don't now need to get upset and think, oh my God, revelation is not true. Why? Because you've understood the nature of science. It's progressive. It's dynamic. It's time bound. There may be another observation in the future that contradicts our current conclusions. So take it easy. And so it would be committing what you would call an epistemological disqualification to think that science is on the same level as revelation. Because revelation, and we could talk about this uh, another Zoom meeting, which is uh, we know it's from Allah for so many different reasons, and that is come from Allah, Al Hakim, the wise, Al Alim, the all knowing. He has the total picture, we just have a pixel. You can't say that is the same as human knowledge of science, which is based on limited data. Allah has the picture, we've got the pixel. Allah has the picture, we've got the pixel. So you can't say now the pixel is the picture, right? We need to be humble here. Look at the history of science, how it's developed and changed over time. 
just what 100 years ago they didn't believe in the beginning of the universe it was a steady state theory 200 years ago just 50 or 60 years ago they they didn't even discover the dna they thought that the cell was just like protoplasm or cytoplasm and then when they discovered the dna they're like wow what's going on here we need to be humble and most scientists are like that it says unfortunately the loud atheists have basically uh T- the loud atheists have taken uh, uh, the microphone and they're shouting and screaming. But when you study science properly, it should humble you. And it should make you realize, you know what? This is my limited understanding. Even though it's well-confirmed theory and it's it got predictive power, it can change. Even Richard Dawkins says this in his own works. So since this is the nature of science, it should never bother you really. I mean, it doesn't bother me. So when we go back to the embryology point... I will say one of the dangers of atheism or this thing or whatever it is, one of the dangers is uh, uh, a marketing technique called repetition. You say something over and over and over and over and over, over, people start to think, or maybe it's true. Uh, Okay, next question, Hamza. Here we go. Recent attacks and arguments against Prophet Muhammad sallam. how do we defend him? What is the best way? Well, I think the best way to defend anyone is to really especially the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to become like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet was actually a walking Quran according to his wife Aisha radiallahu anha, may Allah have mercy on her. Uh, may Allah be pleased with her. So become like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the striking characteristics of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he had hilm, he had halim, because Allah is al-halim. And we should be from a human-centric point of view a manifestation and expression of Allah's names and attributes. So he was Halim, and a very beautiful verse in the Quran in chapter 41, verse 34, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Good and evil are not the same. Repel but that which is better. And hatred between two people, it would turn to intimate friendship. And what's very interesting in this verse is Allah says, Repel by that which is better. The Arabic word repel is not followed by a direct object, meaning it's not followed by repel evil. But some of the translations you see repel evil, but in the Arabic it's repel by that which is better. Now this can mean repel anything by that which is better. And the Mufassireen, those who explain the Quran, they said that what does that which is better mean? Well, we're raising this question. They answer it by saying, become a person of beauty and a person of virtue. Become a person of beauty and become a person of virtue and if you always repel by that which is better you will change the narrative that's number one number two we should also directly deal with the accusations just like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with the accusations against the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for example allah says your companion is not deluded sahibukum your companion and that's a very powerful refutation in just one word Allah doesn't say your prophet. Allah doesn't say Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah doesn't say all of these things. He says your companion, because Allah is saying with one word, companion, your close, intimate per- friend, that He's reminding them, the accusers, you've spent at least forty years with this man. You've ate with him. You've travelled with him, or you've done. You've seen him. You've had seen no sign of madness or delusion ever. How come you're claiming this now? You're deluded. And what's interesting in psychological studies, generally speaking, that when you want to, yeah, when a psychiatrist want to yeah, find yeah, out about yeah, someone's yeah. got a mental problem or they're deluded or whatever the case may be, they interview friends and family. And Allah is saying, your companion. So refute those claims. So sometimes you'd have the claim that the Prophet Sallam was, you know, a womanizer, na'udhu billah, because he had, you know, uh, many wives. Now, when you study the human nature of the marriages of the Prophet Sam, you'd be like, this had nothing to do with like lust or someone who was a womanizer. No, in actual fact, you would realize one of the primary things and the ulama, the scholars talk about this, that the Prophet Sam was a mercy to the worlds. He was a human being that had lots of love to give. He was someone who engaged in deep, meaningful, loving relationships, which is the antithesis to someone who is a lustful person. Yeah, And it's very interesting that when you look at the narratives of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ and you look at his life and his history, that you could only conclude he was an extremely loving person that had a lot of love to give to his wives. And it was to the extent that he created loving, meaningful relationships with his wives at the same time, That's right? Reasoning. And he had nothing to do with all of this stuff. So, and you remember, sometimes when people raise a question, it says more about them than it says about 
what yeah. they're questioning. Yeah. And, and you know, ah, oh, the person someone was a was a womanizer. That's because you're a bloody womanizer. That's why, because you already have that in your heart, right? You have to allow the narrative to speak for themselves. Allow the data to speak for itself. And this is an interesting point. You know, there was this uh, EDL guy. I think he was always saying, "Oh, talking about Muhammad Sallam was a pedophile and Alza Billah," mm-hmm. and he was saying all of these things. Do you know what the da- the Daily Mail? We don't refer to the Daily Mail, but it's an interesting point. The Daily Mail did a did a report on him that the guy used to say things about the Prophet Sallam. He actually got he got caught and he's in prison for pedophilia. So that goes to show that, you know, wallahi, listen to this. This is a spiritual point, brothers and sisters. It's tadabbur. I'm not saying it's 100% accurate, but it's my pondering. The Quran is a mirror. You don't read the Quran. It reads you. You find yourself in the Quran. I'm telling you. So if you're full of this stuff, this negativity and nasty stuff, you're going to find it. And it's it's very interesting because it echoes what Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran. Um, when Allah talks about the ambiguous and unambiguous verses. So Allah is basically saying, focus on the unambiguous verses. They're clear. They're the mother of the book, the the the, the foundation of the book. But those who go to the unambiguous, those who go to the ambiguous verses, and they have a sickness in their heart, Allahu Akbar, and they try and you know do this uh, linguistic or, or or explanatory. It's also very interesting because the concept of God in the monotheistic traditions is of a transcendent God, especially in Islam. Because Allah says in the Quran, Laysa kimislihi shay. No, there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, how, you know, human, how can human beings come up with the concept of transcendence? Meaning it transcends your imagination, transcends any physical thing, transcends the world, the universe itself. That idea had to be introduced external to them yeah i think this is is, is is a lot to unpack there and to think about for sure so for example you know the concept of god in the islamic tradition specifically is of one of unique monotheism which basically says that allah is transcendent the quran says there is nothing like allah in actual fact the arabic is there is nothing like his likeness yeah so it's like a a hyperbolic way of saying, you know, it's even impossible to, you know, uh, try and compare Allah to anything. He transcends anything physically you've come up with. He transcends the universe. He transcends everything. So if human beings only develop concepts by what they observe, then how on earth did they come up with the idea of a transcendent creator that is unlike his creation and unlike anything? So that is absolutely phenomenal point that uh, uh, Sheikh Jalal is saying for sure. And not just that, and we alluded to this in the beginning, but we didn't probably have time to expand further. But we also have arguments to show that this creator exists, which are from the Quran and also based on a sound intellect. For example, if the universe began, it couldn't come from nothing. It couldn't create itself. It couldn't be created ultimately by something else that was created because that's a infinite regress of causes which is impossible therefore there must have been uncreated creator um, and so on and so forth so absolutely I, 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 what you said is is actually quite profound and i think if i remember correctly there's actually a well-developed philosophical argument called the ontological argument in philosophy that deals with something similar to what you're saying but obviously the way you said it was far more eloquent and, and inspiring okay, here we go Assalamu alaikum. I really enjoyed the show. What is the ruling regarding a Muslim who doubts in the religion? Is he a non-Muslim or a hypocrite? Allah has said, only those are the believers who have believed in Allah and his messenger. And afterward, doubt not, but strive with their wealth and their lives for the cause of Allah. Those, they are the truthful. This is Surah Hujarat, verse 15. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu said, bear witness that there is no God deity, deity worthy of worship except Allah and that I am the messenger of Allah. So if for no person meets Allah with these two, with these two, no, no doubt within him, but he will enter paradise. So what is the ruling on one who doubts for a moment and one who doubts, one who has doubts about the deen all of his life, Allah forbid. So one who doubts for a minute, Hamza, and one who doubts his entire life. Look, there is a difference between shubuhat, destructive doubts, valid questions, and waswasa. 
So we need to make distinctions between these three. So one person may have waswasa, which is say shaitanic whispering. But if they don't believe in it, they have a psychological aversion to it and they don't speak about it or act upon it. According to the hadith of Prophet Sallam, this is a sign of faith, sign of iman. So waswasa, so we have to make these distinctions. Is the shaitanic whispering that you don't believe in, you don't believe it's true, you have a psychological aversion to it, you won't speak about it or act upon it, this is a sign of faith. Secondly, you have valid questions. You could question, for example, let me find out why the Qur'an is from Allah, but at the same time, you believe the Qur'an is from Allah. Because remember, <clears throat> you could try and find an answer for an intellectual question, but you're in your heart, you're already convinced. That's not an issue. So that type of questioning is not the type of question that would take it outside of the fold of Islam. You already affirm Allah exists, you believe in His revelation, but you're asking, how do I prove the existence of God in this way? How do I rationally prove the Qur'an is from Allah? That doesn't mean you don't believe the Qur'an is from Allah, because you may believe for other reasons, spiritual reasons, whatever the case may be. But the point is, sometimes it's raising a question is not a problem. As long as it doesn't want to distort the religion, and it doesn't want to undermine the foundations of the religion. Now, shubuhat, they're different. Shubuhat, shubha, tushbihu, to resemble the truth by its, its, its actual falsehood. A shubha is something that wants to drain your faith away, okay? And when you you enter into that state to the degree where you want to change the religion, distort the religion of Islam, and you actually uh, have destructive doubts about the fundamentals, then that is a very problematic from an Islamic spiritual point of view. But I want to change your question slightly. You need, irrespective of the ruling, it doesn't change someone's state. If a Muslim has destructive doubts to the degree they want to change the religion, distort the religion, they don't believe in Allah, they doubt to that degree that is almost kufr or it's kufr, a, a form of disbelief. Knowing the ruling does, would not necessarily change that person. That person needs help. That person needs support. They, needs to be, they need to be brought back. And we need to make people realize that the doors of mercy are always open. The doors of mercy are always open. And if we close those doors, then we become shayateen. By definition, you're a shaitan. If whoever closes yeah. the door of mercy to you, whoever <laughs> closes the door of mercy to you is by definition a shaitan. Because no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what you believe previously in your life, no matter what you've gone through, no matter who you've uh, mistreated, no, no matter what you've done, even if it's, you've killed a thousand people, wallahi, and Allah is my witness, the doors of mercy are open. The doors of mercy are open. You, and you just have to walk through. Allah says, Ya ibadi, all my believing servants, do not despair of the mercy of Allah, for Allah forgives all sins. We know the famous, yeah, and that's the distinction between waswasa and destructive shubuhat. So mm -hmm. if you have destructive shubuhat, which is destructive but doubts. What I meant was, sorry, what I meant was yep. if you don't deal with that doubt, on the day of death, the doubts, shaitan with the waswas, will get you on what you didn't deal with inside before. Oh, I see. Yes. But the, the, the question here is we have to find out what the sources of the, the doubts are. For some it's people... It's always intellect, isn't it? It's always knowledge. You obviously well, lack... Well, you know what? Yeah. In actual fact, Chef, I think this is a bit more than that. It could be intellectual. But from my experience with dealing with atheists or people who left Islam, rarely it's really intellectual. They use the intellect as an excuse, but behind that is something else. And I've got so many amazing experiences that I should share one day to show that in actual fact, it was an emotional issue. Like they had a problem with their father or they, they made lots of money from a gambling business or whatever the case may be. But the point here is this. Find out what the source is. And the source could be that you don't... Like I give an example. Uh, there was a Pakistani atheist that came up There's to There's no me. doubt that most atheists hate God because of something <laughs> happened in their life. There's no doubt about that. Well, listen to this one, Chef. There was one Pakistani atheist that came to me and he said to me, Hamza, you're... Uh, you know, argument from God's existence doesn't make sense because causality doesn't make sense outside of the universe. Now, okay, obviously, I, I, I've studied philosophy. I know the answer to this kind of thing. But I had a feeling that this wasn't <laughs> his real issue. It wasn't his real issue. So I said to him, listen, bro, what do you mean by causality? And he basically said to me, well, uh, 
to cut on story short, he said, I don't know, because I unraveled to him that even in Western philosophy, they haven't ironed out what is the nature of the causal link. So how can you say causality doesn't make sense out of the universe? You're assuming something about causality that you have no knowledge of. Anyway, he said, I don't know. And I said to him, isn't it very interesting, bro, that you are rejecting Allah using a concept or a word that you don't know the meaning of? I was like, what's wrong, bro? So we sat down, I tried to be empathic with him, and he really came out and said, look, I might remember, he said, I couldn't connect with God. I came back, I came from a, a, a secular family. I didn't know how to pray properly. I didn't have that feeling. So his question was first intellectual, but I unraveled it. And just based on my own experience, I realized that wasn't the real issue. And his issue was a spiritual one, or his issue was one of connection. So we need to really find out what is the real issue here. Um, because sometimes when people come across with come, they come out with intellectual stuff. They don't really know that stuff in any detail. It's just an excuse for something else that's going on sometimes. So it could be a spiritual issue. So that means read the Quran, do Toba. It could be do Dhikr. It mean it could mean deal with your past trauma. You may associate negative. Like I was in uh, our town, and uh, I met someone. He said, "Oh, good debate with Professor Kraus, but I'm an atheist. He was he was a he seemed to be a Pakistani Muslim." And I said to him, how are your parents? And you know what? It's as if he basically said to me, how did you know I had issues with my parents? And then he starts speaking about that rather than any atheist. So you just took a guess, right? You took a guess? Well, some, well, from experience, bro, you know, when you develop all these experiences, sometimes you see like quasi patterns. I'm not saying it's, 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 a, it's a science, but you get to realize certain yeah, things, yeah, yeah, especially, yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially, yeah. When, especially Sheikh, when people contradict themselves. I had another experience of this Muslim boy coming from a very practicing family. He was doing the algorithm for a social media company and we were talking about consciousness, all of that stuff. And I asked him, you know, you know, <laughs> why don't you believe in God? And he gave me an answer that contradicted his previous position. And I was like, and I exposed that contradiction. And that for me is a sign of a psychological thing going on. So what I said to him was, I said, look, maybe there's my, there, there was an issue with the family or you had an issue with a father figure and I brought it to my own experience. I didn't want to really expose him. But the minute I did that, he switched. He got aggressive. He started crying. And then his mother told us that he had issue with father figures. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying it's all emotional, psychological experience, but what I'm trying to show is that these experiences teach me. Well, there's that, no doubt there, right? Yeah, so, Chef, just a final point, if you don't yeah. mind me saying. Um, so, I, so everything I've said, can be read into with more detail because we, we, we spoke about so many things we couldn't unpack. I wrote a book called The Divine Reality. It's free online. Uh, uh, if you don't mind me saying, if you go to sapiensinstitute.org, you could download the book for free. Okay, it's a revised Somebody, edition. Sapiens, S A P I E N T. I know, it's S A P I E N C E institute.org. Oh, and uh, sapiens. Sapiens. Yeah, sapiens. Sapiens. Yeah, it means it means wisdom. Uh, Institute.org forward slash. Uh, just put books and you could download the book and it's for free. It's about atheism. So, you know, it's, no one's making money from this. It's just, you know, just take it. Can you and guys just... please uh, type that out and paste that link onto the. Because uh, I'm, chat... I'm just worried about the stuff about the philosophy of science, the stuff about the Quran, chapter 52, verse 35 to 36. That's all fully explained in the book in more detail. So, and you could use that to empower yourself and you could share it with atheists too. Uh, Alhamdulillah, there's been positive feedback. So um, apologies for the shameless plug, but I wanted people to have a reference. <laughs> I was going to ask you about your book. Not at all, man. Not at uh, all. Sorry. Yeah. Apologies. But no, yeah, so know. yeah, you're right. I was so ask you about it. It's fine because we want people to down, uh, sorry, order this book. I was going to mention it and I kind of forgot. I listen, man, I'm on the website. Where is it? If you go to books, if you go to read, yeah, and then you go to books, it's right there. Yeah, I'm looking at it, but how do you order it? You just click it, and then you put your email, and it comes straight away, download, automatic. Oh, it's a PDF? Yeah, it's a PDF, yeah. Which one? The Divine Reality, The Scientific Deception, and On Human Being, yeah? Yeah, those are three different books. The Divine Reality is the one uh, that I'm talking about. Oh, this is by other people. Okay, so the one by you is The Divine Reality, so not the other yep. one other people they well divide. they could download the other ones as well they're really good as well mashallah yeah i know brother osman osman latif and uh, muhammad hijab i know who they are i've seen their videos online as well so on human being and scientific exceptions but you know what i'm gonna get this the, the divine reality 
God, Islam, and the mirage of atheism. Beautiful. Hamza, the next question for you, yeah? Uh, it's really important. Uh, this question is really important. Why do religions give God attributes that are similar to human? Love, compassion, wrath, etc. Does this just show that man must have created God because we gave him attributes similar to humans? Now, just a few minutes ago, I, I, I proposed my argument that it is impossible for a human being to have created God simply because he's mentally, intellectually not capable, never has done, never will create anything from nothing. So he has to be introduced to the concept of God. He couldn't have invented it because he's never done it again, ever, in anything. Man has never created anything from nothing. It just doesn't happen. So having said that, coming back to the beginning part of the question, Hamza, why do religions have give sorry why do religions show god attributes to be similar to human yeah so the first and important point about the islamic tradition uh tawheed monotheism when you talk about the tawheed of asma wa sifat the tawheed of allah's names and attributes we actually don't make any connection or analogy or similarity to god because uh, when it comes to god's names and attributes the first thing we do is that we say that they are transcendent there is nothing like Allah. Also, what we say is that his names and attributes are maximally perfect. We have a maximal perfect theology, meaning God's names and attributes have no deficiency and no flaw. Contrastingly, human names and attributes are not maximally perfect. They have deficiencies and they have flaws. So the question itself is slightly misleading from the point of view just because, for example, we say Allah is al-wudud, he is the loving, and we can be loving as well, that you now assume some kind of similarity. But no, that's not the case at all. Yes, we affirm the meaning of them, but we affirm the meaning in the context of that they are transcendent, they are maximally perfect, they have no deficiency, and they have no flaw, which is in line with what Sheikh said, that is there anything that we experience in the world that is maximally perfect, that has no deficiency and flaw? No. So where did they get the idea from? Where do we get the idea of something is maximally perfect with no deficiencies and flaws? Because the real world doesn't have anything that is maximally perfect without any deficiencies and flaws. So it must have been introduced to them. So exactly. So it just reaffirms the Sheikh's point. And the next one is, uh, okay, Hamza, can, uh, can you please talk about intuition direct experience as a source of knowledge oh wow uh well just to give you a a, a a quick answer is i don't know much about this at all i have thoughts about this but what i'm gonna say is don't take it as the gospel truth as they say it's just my intuitions on the topic of intuitions <laughs> um so i don't know much about it at all but i think you know, experience is very important because there's one thing about knowing something in an abstract way, but then becoming that thing requires you to experience it in the real world. And I'm a huge, I'm extremely passionate about people living their tradition, living their abstract knowledge, because Islam is not an abstract idea. You can't say Islam is is equivalent of me saying that I'm holding a mobile phone right now. Yes, they're both propositions. Saying that Allah exists and he's worthy of worship is a proposition. And saying that I'm holding a mobile phone is also a proposition, or this is a mobile phone. But is that really the same thing? We can't say it's the same thing. Because Islam is not just knowledge. It's a form of knowing that is changes your heart, changes your tongue, what you say, and changes the way you act, the way you relate to yourself, the way you relate to others, and the way you relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that changes your state of being. So we're human beings, not human doings. So it's very important to experience the tradition as much as possible. So what do I mean by this? I give an example. There are people in our community that know verses about dhikr, about the remembrance of Allah. They know the hadith, the prophetic traditions about the remembrance of Allah and the impact of remembering Allah. They know the virtues, but does that make them become someone who remembers Allah? Some people know all of that abstract information, but they don't become it. Islam should teach us to become it, and it does teach us, and that requires us experiencing things, and we have to experience 
you know, praying to Allah. Like, for example, how can you put into words, you know, the most amazing salah, the most amazing prayer that you've ever had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You can't. They have to experience it themselves. Like, similarly to my mother's cooking, you know, she makes a really nice Greek sweet dish called ghala do bureko. It is awesome. I could go in the house and eat about 10 or 12 in one go, no problem, yeah? And, but, you know, if I were to give you the ingredients and how she makes it, it wouldn't be the same. But the way to taste my mom's sweet dish is to come to her house and actually experience it for yourself. And that's why when I became, when I became Muslim... I'm going to take that as an invitation, Hamza. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. When I became a Muslim, uh, one of the reasons I became a Muslim is not only intellectual. I learned how to pray before I became Muslim. I became Muslim 18 years ago. And I used to be in sajda. And I remember my one of the friends, now his name is Dr. Amir, may Allah bless him. He Amen. said, the closest you are to your Lord is in prostration, so supplicate to your Lord. I remember uh, being in sajda and saying to Allah, God just saw me out. <laughs> Help me. What's the truth? So and you know, when I talk to people about Islam and I talk to people about Allah, I always tell them, listen, right now, you don't know, etc. We'll talk again. But just go home and speak to Allah. If you don't know, it's fine. But at least speak to him. And if he doesn't exist, you don't need to worry about it. Just at least speak to him to see, are you there? Talk to him. And by Allah, that's where it starts. Think of me, I'll think of you. Uh, you know, walk to me, I'll, I'll, I'll take two steps to you. Come to me, it's, come to me running, I'll come to you much faster. This is a, a beautiful verse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a beautiful example. I think earlier you gave an example of the Quran being a mirror. And I think people missed that point because it, that's when it disconnected, apparently, people told me, uh, messages. So I just want to say, Ham, Brother Hamza mentioned the Quran is a, a mirror. And the example I gave is a video on YouTube of a brother in Australia who took Shahada. You can look it up on YouTube. So he went out saying all kinds of difficult tests and hardships in his life. He went out of his house saying, this is it, God. If you're there, show me. And he spoke to him. And that's what it takes. So he looked up at the sky, clear day. So no stars. No, I'm sorry, no rain, no storm. So he's like, it's going to be hard to give me a sign. But God, give me a sign. Show me something. Make something happen. And he waited. He said it again and again. Nothing happened. And he said, this is the last time I'm going to try. If you're not there, you're not there. And he gave up. And then he came back into the house. It was quite sad. A lot has happened to him. And uh, when he came back into the house, he found a Quran that his friend had given him. He said, okay, let me just give this a shot. He opens the book in the middle like we do sometimes. He just opened it. And in the middle it said, and if it is a sign from your Lord that you seek, you need only look into creation and be in awe of the glory of Allah's creation. How amazing is that? And what Hamza was saying is that the Quran is actually like a mirror. When you open it, it it reads you and it knows what you need to hear. And that's quite phenomenal. So Hamza, we're going to end with this last question, man. You must be exhausted. I do apologize. Um, This question is, Assalamu alaikum, another great Friday halakha, the best day of my week, alhamdulillah. Is it a good idea to give a Quran to a person for da'wah as it's not easy to understand translations with limitation? And I feel it may cause them confusion. Therefore, should really, should we readily give out Qur'ans to people on Taoist stalls or better to stick to stuff specifically on Tawheed or proofs of existence? What do you say? Yeah, this is actually a controversial question in the Dawah. In, not controversial from the point of view that is right or wrong, but it's about, you know, what is the correct approach? Because there are some, you know, this, a Sahabi, I believe, he said, that we had iman before we we basically you know learned the Quran or or, or or knew the whole of the Quran. So their faith came before that. So one would argue maybe just speaking about Allah, speaking about Tawheed is enough to create those awakenings and to create that conviction. Now, conversely, other people have actually become Muslim because of reading the Quran. So what I would say is I'm not too sure about this one. Just find out who that person is. And that's why in Dawah, you have to listen with the intention to understand. Many of us, we don't know how to listen. We need to listen with the intention intention to understand them. So once you become intellectually and spiritually mature to do that, you'll get signs in their behavior and the way they speak to find out what they really need. Sometimes people become Muslim just because you were nice to them. 
And that's, that was enough. That's all they needed because they knew stuff before. Maybe they just wanted a pizza with you and that would have been the good interaction because they already had information that was necessary for belief, but they needed that little bit of a push to see a positive experience with the Muslim. It could be that they need a rational argument. And yes, Islam has amazing proofs and rational arguments. It could be that they needed a spiritual experience. It could be that they need direct revelation. Remember what we spoke about, about the fitra in the beginning? It's like yeah. a car that's clouded and, and you can uncloud the windscreen so the car could direct itself and travel towards the truth. But the question is, there are different ways of unclouding that windscreen. It's not always rational arguments. For one person, it might mean they need direct access to revelation. So I think the best way to answer this question is find out who that person is, try and suss out how to uncloud the windscreen of the fitra. And it may be that the unclouding process will happen just by giving them revelation. Or it could be not. It could be they just need a good conversation or it could mean that they need a spiritual experience. Allah knows. But that requires you to be have to be sincere with them and listen with the intention to understand them and then you will pick out what that person might need and unfortunately in the dawah people don't do that anymore people think one way and khalas let me prove this prove that and it's a done deal human beings brothers and sisters and friends are not computers you don't type in an algorithm and something comes out we need to treat the human being as Allah has taught us the human being has a ruh, has a soul, has a qalb, has an aql, has a nafs, has a fitra. All of these things are, in, are interconnected in some way. There's a dynamic interplay going on, right? So mm. why would you say, you know, there's one way of dealing with them? No, it could be that they need direct revelation. That's the way to uncloud their fitra. Or it could be they need rational arguments. The only way to know is by engaging with that. Brother Hamza, any final words from yourself? Um, no, just the fact that Zafra are here for the opportunity. And, you know, we touched on so many different things. And obviously, a lot of these things sometimes need unpacking as well. Allow this to plant the seed in your heart and mind to continue your own intellectual and spiritual journey and for you to, you know, gather more information and knowledge on these topics as well. But fundamentally, when it comes to issues of Iman, don't forget to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remind myself first and foremost about this. Because if you think about it, the Prophet ﷺ was the best human being that walked this planet. And he would make dua, he would supplicate to Allah that his heart is firm on the religion. Also in the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was the destroyer of idols, he made dua to Allah that Allah would protect him and his family from falling into polytheism. And, and shirk and idol worship and the sahaba the greatest nation to have walked this earth one sahabi i believe he said he, he he saw 30 sahaba and they were worried about hypocrisy in their hearts subhanallah so the best of people from the prophets to the sahaba the companions of the prophet they were worried about this what about us then and they would supplicate to allah so dua is the essence of worship. So make dua to Allah that he keeps us firm on his religion. And that's all I have to say.